And that's the obvious thing where I just have more coordinates. And a theorem um, that appears in, probably in most undergraduate maths courses, um, the main thing you learn about abelian groups is the classification of finitely generated abelian groups, in particular of finite abelian groups. And the theorem, um, basically what it says is that every finitely generated abelian group, so every abelian group that's just generated by a finite set of its elements, is just a direct sum of cyclic groups. So this means that, well, because cyclic groups are very easy to understand, direct sums are very easy to understand, this means that finite abelian groups or finitely generated abelian groups are just not very complicated at all. And I think a lot of people, when they, they learn this theorem, this is the main thing about abelian groups, you probably learn as an undergraduate, it's very tempting to think, well, abelian groups are just rather dull and uninteresting. Okay, so what I'm going to try to persuade you today is that it's only the finitely generated ones that are dull and uninteresting. And I'm going to show lots of really quite bizarre things that can happen when you look at, at infinitely generated abelian groups. So some examples of finitely generated abelian groups and um, the group of integers, that's an infinite cyclic group. The integers mod nine under addition, that's a finite cyclic group. So a uh, finitely generated abelian group will look something like this. Or another example, we might just take a direct sum of lots of copies of some very small cyclic group. OK, on the other hand, well, there are some infinitely generated abelian groups that you, you look at as undergraduates. And one is the group of rational numbers under addition. So it's not a terribly bizarre abelian group, but it's definitely not a direct sum of cyclic groups. In fact, um, well, it's not cyclic, and it can't be written as a direct sum of two non-trivial groups. Okay, so infinitely generated abelian groups are, at least, even the familiar examples are a little bit different. So let's look at another example of an infinitely generated abelian group. Let's take the group of sequences of integers. Okay, so an element will just be a sequence where all the terms are integers. I'm going to be talking about sequences an awful lot, so I'll introduce some nice compact notation for this. If I write an A underlined, I just mean the sequence with terms A0, A1, A2, and so on. Okay, so I'm writing a vector or something. And this is a group in an obvious way. It's obvious how you can add two sequences. You just add the first coordinates, you add the second coordinates, add the third coordinates, and so on. Okay, so this is an abelian group. It's not finitely generated. And well, this group has lots of um, subgroups that you can look at. So, for example, rather than looking at all sequences, we could look at finite sequences. So, what I mean by a finite sequence is just a sequence which eventually stops and becomes just zeros. So, in other words, only a finite number of the terms of the sequence are non zero. And obviously, if I add two such sequences, I'm going to get another finite sequence. So this is a subgroup. Another thing I could do is take, instead of all sequences, I could take just bounded sequences. So sequences where the, the terms of the sequence are, are bounded by some um, n. And again, if you add two bounded sequences, you get another bounded sequence. So that's a subgroup. Okay, so this is a fairly easy group to, to um, describe. It has some interesting subgroups. And let me give some not terribly surprising properties of this group, but properties that don't happen for finitely generated abelian groups. Okay, first property is that if we take the direct sum of this group with z, 
that's isomorphic to the group we started with. And um, the reason this is not terribly surprising is that this isomorphism between these two groups is very simple. If I take a sequence and an integer, so I take an element of S plus Z, I can just form a sequence by putting the integer at the beginning and then carrying on with the original sequence. So to give a sequence and an integer is really the same thing as just giving this other sequence. Okay, obviously uh, there's no finitely generated abelian group S that has this property. Certainly there's no finite abelian group that has this property. Okay, so that's not terribly surprising and it's really just the fact that um, um, infinite sets behave a bit differently from finite sets. If you have a, a countable, countably infinite set and add one more element, it's still countably infinite. So what I'm doing here is adding one extra term to the sequence. Okay, here's another property that S has. If we take the direct sum of S with itself, that's also isomorphic to S. And again, this is easy to see. If we take two sequences, so A and B, then we can form a single sequence for them just by interleaving the two sequences. I take the first element of A, first element of B, first element of A, sorry, second element of A, second element of B, and so on. So I can just interleave these two sequences to get a single sequence. So I can take an ordered pair of elements of S and map it to um, just a single element of S, a single sequence of integers. Okay, and again, that's something that uh, definitely can't happen for finite abelian groups, well, apart from the trivial group, I guess, but for non-trivial abelian groups, this definitely doesn't happen because of course, S plus S is going to be bigger than S. But when we're dealing with infinite sets, I mean, what's behind this is just the fact that if we take um, the disjoint union of two countably infinite sets, that's still countably infinite. Okay, so neither of these are anything very interesting from a group theoretic point of view, but this is just to illustrate that there are some not terribly surprising, but different things that you should expect to happen. Okay, so let's start looking at some more surprising properties that groups might have. So Kaplansky was a famous algebraist who was very active in the middle of the 20th century and he wrote uh, in 1954 he wrote a very nice very short book on infinite abelian groups so around this time i mean people i guess had sort of looked at individual abelian groups um, people were maybe wondering whether there was some way of classifying them in the same way that you could classify finitely generated abelian groups um, and this was, book was written about the beginning of the time that people were fairly systematically looking at these things. And well, I think Kaplansky, even at that time, was a bit um, dubious about whether it would be possible to classify abelian groups in general. And in this group, in this book, um, I, it's not ex his exact words, but basically he said, well, if they don't behave at least as well as this, I'll come to what this is in a minute, then what hope would we have of classifying them? And so what he did was he, he gave three test problems. So these are problems that at the time, no one knew the answers to. And they all said, is it possible for this to happen with, um, with abelian groups? And the idea was that if these things could happen, then abelian groups were really weird and it was almost inconceivable what a classification of them would look like. Okay, first test problem. So let's suppose we have two groups, G and H, and suppose that G is isomorphic to H direct sum another group X and H, is isomorphic to G and another group Y. Now it's kind of easy, the same ideas I've just been talking about, it, it's easy to see that um, 
it's possible for G to be isomorphic to H plus something and H to be isomorphic to G plus something if H and G are themselves isomorphic. So the question is, if this happens, is G necessarily isomorphic to H? And in 1954, nobody knew the answer to that. The second test problem, um, let's suppose we have two groups where the direct sum of two copies of G is isomorphic to the direct sum of two copies of H. Does that necessarily mean that G and H have to be isomorphic? So in other words, might we have some, some group, some abelian group, that we can split into the direct sum of two isomorphic groups in two completely different ways. Okay, and again, in 1954, nobody had any idea. And the third test problem, let's suppose you have two groups where G direct sum Z, so Z is just the infinite cyclic group, the group of integers. Suppose that G plus Z is isomorphic to H plus Z. Does that necessarily mean that G must be isomorphic to H? Okay, within about a decade, all three of these questions have been answered, um, as it happens in reverse order. So third test problem, that turned out to be actually quite easy. I mean, when I say easy, I mean, the answer to this is a proof of about a paragraph. I think probably lots of people were embarrassed they hadn't realized it was so easy at the time, but anyway. Um, and Cohn and Walker independently in 1956, so very shortly after Kaplansky's book, showed that in fact, the answer is yes. So in this case, there aren't any bizarre things happening. Okay, but for the other two problems, the next one to be solved again fairly soon by Jensen. Um, the answer to this one is no. So Jensen described a rather strange and intricately constructed pair of groups that he could prove were not isomorphic, but where G plus G was isomorphic to H plus H. Okay, which seems a rather bizarre thing to happen, but anyway, he, he showed the answer to that was no. Okay, so it's now becoming, if you think of things like Kaplansky, it's now becoming less hopeful that we can have a classification of infinite abelian groups. And then it took a little while longer so in 1961, Sarsiada also answered the first question negatively. So he came up with, again, a fairly intricate example of um, two groups, each of which was the direct sum of the other one plus something. Okay, so, um, so around this time then, people were realizing that infinite abelian groups could have some fairly um, bizarre properties. Um, people started finding more and more bizarre properties that abelian groups could have around this time. And one of the most famous examples was an example given by um, a mathematician from Oxford called Corner. And he proved in the 1960s Okay, we've seen an example of an abelian group that is isomorphic to the direct sum of two copies of itself. And exactly the same argument proves that it's isomorphic to three copies of itself. But there's a group with a rather stranger property, which is that it is isomorphic to the direct sum of three copies of itself. That in itself is not too surprising, but it's not isomorphic to the direct sum of two copies of itself. Okay, so this is another uh, really quite strange phenomenon. And the construction of this group is even more intricate than, than those of uh, Johnson and um, Sassiada that answered uh, Kaplansky's first two test problems. Um, okay, 
Kaplansky wrote a second edition of his book on infinite abelian groups in 1969. And he, he changed this section a little bit and said, in this strange part of the subject, anything that can conceivably happen actually does happen. So his idea was, if, you, if you're asked any question about infinite abelian groups, if you can't very quickly prove something is impossible, then probably it's possible. Okay. okay, what I'm going to do for the rest of the talk is describe to you uh, an abelian group whose definition is not too hard to understand and show how it provides an answer to some of, provides more examples of some of these bizarre, um, bizarre behaviors. Okay, and I'll call this group A. Let's start off with the set Z of root two. So this, I just mean um, the set of real numbers you can write as an integer plus an integer times root two. And let's start off with a group I'll call T. So just as I can take sequences of integers and they form a group under addition, if I take sequences of this set Z of root two, so sequences whose terms are all real numbers in Z of root two, that's also an abelian group under addition. Okay. Um, so this group, this group is really nothing new because it's actually the same group as the group of sequences of integers under addition. Because remember that we saw earlier, so S is the group of sequences of integers. We saw that S is isomorphic to the direct sum of two copies of itself, just by interleaving two sequences to get a single sequence. And it's easy to see that if I take two sequences of integers, a pair of sequences of integers, I can map that to the following element of T. I can take the first term of the first sequence plus the first term of the second sequence times root two to get an element of this. I can do the same with the first term, sorry, the second term of um, A and the second term of B to get another element of this. So I've just constructed from these two sequences of integers, a single sequence of elements of Z of root two. Okay, and this is, it's easy to check that this is an isomorphism of groups. Okay, so um, th this, th this root T is, is nothing new. It's really just the same as S. So what I'm going to be doing then is essentially I gave you a couple of examples of subgroups of S. Remember the finite sequences of integers and the bounded sequences of integers. So really what I'm going to do is describe another subgroup of S, except I'm going to describe it as a subgroup of the um, isomorphic group T. Okay, so uh, this is just reminding you what T is. T is the group of sequences of elements of this set. And then the group I'm really going to be interested in, I'm just going to take bounded sequences in here. So bounded sequences of elements of Z of root two. And by bounded here, I just mean considered as a sequence of real numbers. So elements of this are real numbers. And so you all know what it means for a sequence of real numbers to be bounded. Um, yeah, I point out that um, if you take two integers a and b, even if a and b are very large in absolute value, it's possible that a plus b root two. So, for example, if 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 a is positive, and b is negative, then these two terms could almost cancel out, and you could be left with some very very small real number, even if A and B are very large. 
So this means um, that the boundedness of a sequence in T, it doesn't really have much to do whether, with whether considered as a sequence of, of integers, if we just write down the AIs and the BIs that occur, those could certainly be unbounded, even if the sequence of numbers you get by combining that, them like this is bounded. Okay, so even though T uh, was isomorphic to the group S of all sequences of integers, bounded sequences in T is not the same by any means as bounded sequences in S. Okay, so um, this, this is definitely a different group from the group of bounded sequences of integers. Okay, let's look at some properties of this group A. So A is bounded sequences of elements of Z of root two. Um, well, exactly the same proof as with S shows that the direct sum of two copies of A is isomorphic to A because I just take two sequences and just interleave them. Odd terms are going to be the sequence X, the even terms are going to be the sequence Y. So I can combine two sequences to get a single sequence. And I'm not splitting them up into the A and the B and the A plus B root two. Um, Another thing that's fairly easy to see is that if I take the direct sum of A and two copies of Z, that's isomorphic to A. And again, the idea is similar to why um, S direct sum Z was isomorphic to S. The idea there being I could just add an extra term to the beginning of a sequence. Well, here, if I take a sequence of elements of um, Z of root two, and I take two integers for these two copies of Z, I can use those two integers as the coefficients of an element of Z of root two. I can just take A plus B root two. And then I can put that number at the beginning of the sequence as the first term of my sequence and then shift up the other elements of the original sequence to form a single sequence of elements of Z of root two. Okay, so that's um, um, fairly similar to something we've seen before. Okay, here's a property that A doesn't have. Okay, this is kind of the, the, the the main thing you need to prove. I'm not going to give the whole proof of it because I don't really have time in 45 minutes. Um, but the proof is not so long. It's maybe three or four pages long. And that is that although, as we've just seen, it's fairly easy to see that A plus Z plus Z is isomorphic to A, A plus Z is not isomorphic to A. Okay, so as I say, I'm not going to give a proof but let me just describe why one thing you might try to do to prove that they are isomorphic doesn't work. Okay, so what you might think to try is to take an element of A, to take a sequence of numbers of the form AI plus BI root two, take an integer, and then combine these to get another sequence of elements of the form a plus b root two by just using a, a naught, a one, and so on as the, um, the coefficients of one, and using b naught, b one, and so on as the coefficients of root two. So we're shifting along the ais to make room for one extra integer, but we're leaving the bis where they originally were. But this doesn't work. This, um, this doesn't work because if X is bounded, if X is an element of A, 
then there's no reason at all to expect that the numbers in this sequence should be bounded. Okay, remember the, the individual AIs and BIs could be absolutely huge, even if AI plus BI root two is always very small. But when we shift the, the A's along, that's not necessarily still going to be the case. And in fact, you can show that there will definitely will be examples where it's not the case. Okay, and there are other things you might think of trying, but you always run into the same problem that uh, whatever ways you think of taking a sequence of elements of Z of root two and one extra integer and building a single sequence. There's just no way of doing that that will take always take bounded sequences to bounded sequences. So it's the, the boundedness that uh, causes a problem in trying to write down any isomorphism. And as I say, there isn't any isomorphism. You can prove that. Okay, so um, okay, so the two properties we've seen so far for this group are well, three properties, I guess, are that um, a plus a is isomorphic to a. A plus Z plus Z is isomorphic to A, but A plus Z is not isomorphic to A. Okay, so try to keep those three properties in mind. They're, they're, those are the only properties I'm going to use about A from now on. Um, Okay, so I'm now going to uh, take A plus Z, which is not isomorphic to A, and let's give that a name. Let's call that B. So we've got this group A, we've got B, which is A plus Z, and one of the properties we know is that A is not isomorphic to B. Okay, so now let's go and get on to some weird properties of these groups. Let's look at A. A is isomorphic to A plus Z plus Z. But A plus Z is isomorphic to B. So A is isomorphic to A plus Z plus Z, which is isomorphic to B plus Z. Also, well, we've just defined B to be A plus Z. So A is B plus another group. B is A plus another group, but A and B are not isomorphic. Okay, so these groups give an counterexample, uh, another example um, answering the first test problem. We can have two non-isomorphic groups which are both direct summands of the other one. Okay, now let's look at B plus B. So B is just A plus Z. So B plus B is A plus Z plus A plus Z. But Z plus A plus Z, oops, missed. That's the same as A plus Z plus Z which is isomorphic to A. So this is isomorphic to A plus A. So B plus B is isomorphic to A plus A, but A is not isomorphic to B. So this also gives then um, another example for the second test problem. We can have two non-isomorphic groups so that the direct sum of two copies of one of them is isomorphic to the direct sum of two copies of the other one. Um, okay, so now let's look at B plus B. Well, we've just seen that B plus B is isomorphic to A plus A. A plus A, we know is isomorphic to A just by taking 
two sequences and interleaving them. The A is not isomorphic to B. So that means that B plus B is not isomorphic to B. B is not isomorphic to the direct sum of two copies of itself. On the other hand, look at B plus B plus B, look, the direct sum of three copies of B. Well, B plus B, well, we've just seen in the previous line that that's isomorphic to A. Um, so what am I saying? Sorry, it's slug again. B plus B plus B. Um, B plus B, we've just seen is isomorphic to A. Um, B is just A plus Z. So the direct sum of three copies of B is isomorphic to A, direct sum A plus Z. But A plus A is isomorphic to A. So this is isomorphic to A plus Z, and A plus Z is B. So what we've got here then is we get that the direct sum of three copies of B is isomorphic to B. The direct sum of two copies of B is not isomorphic to B. So that means that this, the group B, so the group we get by taking bounded sequences of elements of Z of root two, and then adding another copy of Z, that group provides a counterexample uh, provides another example of the phenomenon, the weird phenomenon that, that Corner discovered in the 1960s. Um, okay, I think uh, went a little bit quicker than I intended. So um, if you don't mind, I will end there. And thank you for listening. That's all right. Thank you very much. That was interesting. Um, so if anyone has any questions at all, if you're happy to take some, Jeremy, yeah, of um, course. feel free to unmute uh, yourself or type in the chat. I have some questions. Yeah. I... Um, <clears throat> so in the, in the beginning, I was thinking, uh, why are we using Z square root two rather than Z times Z? But with Z square root two, uh, we, we, um, Defined the boundedness, right? This that's is right. Why yeah. we use. That's right. Okay. Yes. Um, also, I want to ask: uh, this the group A is uh, divisible? Do, do we know no. something about no? No. Um, um, I mean, why? <laughs> Can you... um, well, okay. So take. Um, Well, basically, because Z of root two is not divisible, so, um, so, so okay, so so take take the sequence that's um, just every entry is one, 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 okay. one, one. Okay, that's a bounded sequence of elements of Z of root two. Mm -hmm. But if you try to divide that by two, a half, mm -hmm. a half, a half, a half, a half is not in Z of root two. Ah, okay, that's of, of course okay. Uh, can we say like? Um, because of A times Z is not isomorphic to A, uh, can we deduce that from that um, A is not free? Yes, yes, that's yes, correct. Okay. Um, even, even the group S, the group of all sequences of integers, that's not free. Yeah, yeah, of course. But it, even that's not free, maybe A is a might be free, right? Even it's true. Yeah. Okay. Actually, an, an interesting and very, very non-trivial fact is if you take the group of of bounded um, sequences of integers, mm -hmm. it turns out that that is free, but it's very, very hard. Really? To, yeah, yeah. So it's very, very non-constructive. So. Um, it depends heavily on the axiom of choice and things like that. Uh, you said that uh, the bounded sequence with entries from Z is free, right? Yes. Uh, it's interesting. Okay. 
but that's definitely a very non-trivial um, case. So I've had a, had a question in chat. What does Corner's ridiculous group look like? Um, I, I think I have to admit that although I've read his paper and kind of understood line by line what he does, I really don't have much of a mental picture of what it is. It's really, really very complicated. Uh, I had a question actually. So did you say uh, these groups A and B? Mm -hmm. So you came up with your, that yourself then, were they? Or? Um, yeah, so the way I came to this was uh, someone asked the question on math overflow, you know? Oh yeah. yeah. Um, asking if there was um, an example of a group a so that a was isomorphic to um, a plus z plus z but not isomorphic to a plus z right and basically i i came up with this example realized that this isomorphism was almost obvious and everything you tried for this isomorphism failed to work so i thought it might well be an example, but then it took, well, it's only about a year later that I, I thought about it hard enough to actually come up with the proof of this non-isomorphism. Wow. Was it um, at all based on the original counter examples or are those? No, uh, not at all. I, right, yeah. I mean, when I, when I saw this question, I hadn't appreciated the connection with all of these other weird properties, the test problems or corners. Mm. Okay, well, that's interesting. Thank you. Um, I want to ask a question. Hi, yeah, can you yeah. hear me? Okay. Yes. Okay. Yes. Uh, so uh, we were introduced on like how the like how how the groups are uh, like very 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 strangely behave. But is there a way of like? Like, is there a way of like finding those examples that 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 will satisfy? I just want to. I I I, I know it is very hard, but, and this question sounds very really fake. But I just want to know that like, are there any way? Like, why why do you why do you consider let's say the integers group or or instead of any other groups like easy groups like Q or R or some or or, or some or some other examples like that? Why are the why why what properties of the integer or like sequences have this have this like uh property that that will lead you to finding those uh um, properties yeah I don't know I think that's quite hard to answer it's just um I, I mean when I thought of this example I didn't really think right i shall look in sequences of integers for what i want it wasn't anything really like that it's just it kind of occurred to me i can't really even remember how it occurred to me oh, okay. that this might work Sorry. yeah i'm afraid i i don't really have a satisfactory answer for that i think well i have a one more question uh, have yeah. you look uh, at these uh, examples over uh, um, finite extensions of z like z square root three or z okay. i mean any any algebraic uh, integer okay so sure so um there's nothing special about root two here you could use root three square root of three and it would work exactly the same um if you if you used z of say the cube root of two instead of set of root two, mm -hmm. then um, you would then get a, a group where the, the direct sum of A with three copies of Z mm -hmm. is isomorphic to A, but not mm -hmm. the direct sum with two copies of Z or with one copy of Z. So, um, um, I take a general algebraic integer, I'm not sure. Okay. Um, 
Uh, sorry. I, I'm sorry. Uh, I couldn't hear one of the questions. So if anybody asked this before, I apologize for it. But how do you prove that A is not isomorphic to A plus Z? What, what was the idea of the proof? Um, okay, so... Uh, um, So first of all, the idea is that um, you try to describe all homomorphisms from A to A. And it turns out that in order to do that, the key thing to understand is what all group homomorphisms from A to Z of root two are. When you think about it, there are lots of obvious such homomorphisms. For example, you could take an element of A and just map it to its seventh term or something like that. Or you could take sums of things like that. So there are lots of obvious homomorphisms. And the key part of the proof is to prove that there aren't any non-obvious ones. And then once you understand all endomorphisms of A, in other words, all group homomorphisms from A to itself, um, then you have to do a little bit of algebra. Um, and the reason that Z plus Z comes is that if you take um, um, do you know what a module for a ring means? Uh, yes, I know. Yeah. Okay. So if you take any um, module for this ring, that is um, a free Z module, then the rank of that as a Z module must be even. Mm -hmm. Okay, and that means that anything that is a module for this, it can be isomorphic to Z plus Z, but it can't be isomorphic to Z. I see, thank you. So that's kind of the ingredients, but yeah, it takes about, as I say, three or four pages to, to prove it in total. Uh, well, Unless anyone has any more questions, in which case they're free to do so, I guess we can wrap up here then. Okay. So thank you all for coming along and um, giving up your evenings. <laughs> well, thank you very much as well. I know a lot of people are into this and uh, you've given up your evening also. And I think this was certainly very interesting to me. So hopefully everyone else found it interesting as well. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Bye. Bye.